welcome everybody to the Lisa Pronto Monthly Mastermind. Uh, super excited. I think I, of course, always say that, uh, but I am super excited today. We've had an awful lot of tumult and misinformation and somewhat of a panic and somewhat of kind of a re um, uh, a retooling, if you will, of some of the ways we've been walking in the world. And it seemed to me as though it would be a great idea to lean into a couple of amazing commercial agents who have been dealing with talking about buyer compensation for a long time. And so I invited Brittany and Charles. Brittany is from the Florida area. She's actually the, the DMB for Florida for EXP Realty Commercial. Welcome, 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 Brittany. Thank you. And Charles is an amazing commercial agent who uh, is training commercial agents all over the country, but also lives in Los Angeles. So I thought it would kind of be interesting to get somebody from the two different coasts. Uh, and again, I thank Dick Lee for giving me the recommendation of both of you this morning, for sure. Uh, we have lots of people that have um, uh, registered. I think we were close to 70. So we're expecting a nice crowd today. Uh, you know, one of the things I have found is that... Um, Many of us who live in states that don't require a buyer broker agreement or a buyer broker compensation agreement um, have not had these conversations ever, really. Maybe we did in the beginning. If some of us took, like I took my ABR class many years ago and I said, I'm going to have a buyer agreement every time and ask for three apples. And, you know, that never, I don't know if that ever happened. We always wrote in as offered in MLS. If we had a buyer agreement, that's what we were that was one option was always to either put in a number or to put in as offered in MLS under that success fee. Or like we've talked about, you know, before, um, many of us have a referral business. And so those people were handed to us on a silver platter and we didn't feel the need to create any kind of a buyer agreement. So I thought we would start today's session um, with a little bit of a higher level recap of kind of where we are right now. I have a great presentation I'm going to go through pretty quickly that came from corporate, uh, was delivered to us on Monday the 8th here at the Northeast Rally. So let me pull that up right now. Are you all seeing my screen? Okay. All right. So NAR settlement highlights. Again, this was provided by the corporate team at our uh, rally on Monday. And I just wanna go over a couple of highlights to kind of set the table of where we are today. Um, I've got some great talking points, which I will get to at the end if we have time, but um, you know, the actual details of what the settlement is, I mean, many of you have heard, uh, you know, some things about it, um, no matter what, whatever changes will be needed to be implemented will not happen until mid. And now I just read yesterday, late July. So there, you know, the, the Department of Justice has not approved the settlement yet. So we're all working under the assumption that what we have learned about will be what we're putting in practice, but we don't have any skin on it. All right. So we're all just kind of working as best we can every day. Um, and we, as and most agents everywhere, as a single agent, are covered. There's some discussion about certain brokerages. Let's not go into the weeds of that right now. This is kind of the high level pieces of it. No offer of buyer compensation will be listed in the multiple listing service, as we know. Sellers may offer a bunch of concessions via MLS, and we're going to see what those look like. Um, but we may not also offer services as free, although I don't know anybody who has ever done that. So, um, but I, I don't even, you know, but that's certainly it's a, a piece that people are discussing. But there can be no requirement of unconditional unilateral offer of compensation to a buyer broker, which is what we've always had in our MLS. That's in our listing agreements. There's the field for it in MLS. And that's what is not going to be there any longer. So um, that's one of the big major changes. So I wanted to put this slide in. This came from Janie Coffey's presentation for a luxury presentation that we just did on Wednesday about like, well, what the heck do we do? And what are we, what are we standing on to feel confident as we move forward? So here's kind of a top 10 of things that we do in, that we do as buyers and to include in your buyer consult. And I, I will have these slides available. They'll go out um, with the, the wrap up email that my assistant, my executive assistant will be sending. Um, but you know, obviously some of these things, guys, we know we've done this. And I know I used to have buyer consults with people before the pandemic. I would often meet with them when I was in a local brokerage that had an office. 
uh, but not always. I, I, I very often met them at the first property. And since the pandemic, I always met them at the first property because I work for eXp and we don't have a physical office near my office here on Cape Cod. So some of these things are very basic. Get to know them. Ask them what their dreams are. Talk about financing, of course, right? Discuss working with an agent. Discuss what the process looks like. Are you setting them up on a search? What kind of neighborhood are they looking for in your area? What does the offer process look like? Do you have a document that takes them through? Do you have a one page that talks about offer to close? Good idea to do that. Most of us have a marketing design center that has that information in it. Um, talk about cash. Uh, talk about the inspection process, right? What does that mean? What does it include? How much does it cost? What about when you waive it? Uh, and then really something that I think is really important, we talk about it a lot in luxury, but I want to mention it really anywhere. See if this is a good fit. See if these buyers are a good fit for you, right? Not every buyer is a good fit for every agent. And then you want to talk about the closing process and post-closing. So I wanted to mention that now as we get started, because I think remembering the process is super important. Take care of your buyer. Make sure you're going to have to have that buyer broker services agreement signed in advance of any showing. And just to mention that for EXP agents today at the big agent meeting at 11 o'clock this morning was unrolled our first buyer broker one-time agreement. Those will be across the country with every state except for Colorado. I don't know what's going on with Colorado, but all I know is that it said every state but Colorado. Uh, and state brokers will be uh, setting up training on that. Um, I'm, soon, I'm sure that we'll be hearing something as soon as this afternoon. I got a chance to see it this morning. It's got a great FAQ. It's fantastic. Um, also, you know, when you're talking about that buyer strategy session, make sure that you understand what the seller is having as concessions. Right there, there may be all kinds of things that the seller is willing to do in terms of concessions. And one of the most basic things that we, you know, we we've always done this with sellers. We have sat down and we've sold ourselves. We've explained why we're the best agent for them to hire to list the property. We've talked about in some detail or not so much detail what the compensation looks like. Hey, we're going to, you know, we're going to, what I would recommend and what's typical is that we offer five apples or six apples and we offer usually half of that to the buyer broker. So we've already had those conversations about money and what that includes. So we need to do that now with our buyers. We've been doing it all along with our sellers and Brittany and Charles are going to talk to us about how they've done it all along with their buyers as well, of course. Now, I wanted to bring the slide in because I love this note at the bottom. Many MLSs right now are in, developing, in development to add concession fields to MLS. So this may be a workaround from day one. I don't know yet. I mean, everybody is working on how to make this as easy as possible for agents. Because let's not forget, as much as you want to hear the New York Times, we're all making a gazillion dollars and doing nothing. Real estate is the economic engine of the economy. And no one's going to let it fail. And EXP Realty, I can say, and certainly the National Association of Realtors are not going to let us fail and not be prepared for all this. So what's next? There's going to be a ton of updates to realtor forms. Please don't delete those emails right now that come from your state broker, come from National Association of Realtors. There will be some updates to your local MLS. So you've got, you know, the local MLS state's going to be working. Uh, I just got an email yesterday about VA. I mean, we are the 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 NAR and Realtor Political Action Committee is aggressively working with the Veterans Administration to address the piece of VA lending that specifically prohibits buyer compensation to be mentioned in the deal. Everyone knows that that cannot I mean, please, God, thank you for your service. All you veterans, we want to be able to service you, but we need to figure out a way to get that. So they're on top of that. You know, they're already testifying. Kevin's written stuff. Um, that's definitely happening. And the relocation market, I know we have a big piece of that in EXP Realty. We are in conversations with all of those folks now. We have been since that Friday afternoon about how that's going to show up in their agreement. So please know that we everybody is working hard to make sure to address all those pieces that may have fell you know, between those, those cracks. So if you're at EXP, as I mentioned, we have that listing agreement for uh, the, the one-page buyer broker compensation for single showing, that's showing up today in your Skyslope. Um, keep an eye on that. Keep an eye on the broker uh, mentioning, you know, what, what kind of training will be happening from that. And then National Association of Realtors, hopefully you got an email yesterday. If you did not, please scan this QR code. 
this came in your email yesterday somewhere and hopefully you didn't already unsubscribe or it's not in your junk. This is great. It's a great publication that really gives top line facts. I'm sorry you can't read this blue, but it's about you know how to have that conversation, tips for talking to both buyers and sellers, dispelling the seven myths about NAR's proposed settlements. That's huge. And brokers help answer your questions and explain the importance of written buyer agreements. It would be a great thing to share with your sphere of influence. It's a great publication. It's it's an easy read. It's clean. It's it's uh, it's it's really good. So that's that. I just wanted to give some kind of set the table on that. I'm going to stop my share now and go to Brittany and Charles. Um, I wanted both of these guys sent us a PowerPoint this morning, and we kind of combined them. Um, but Brittany and Charles, maybe you could both introduce yourselves in a minute or two uh, about you know how you find yourself here today and what you do um, you know for uh, in real estate. Go ahead, Brittany. Absolutely. So hi, everyone. I'm Brittany Merchkovsky. I am the commercial designated managing broker for Florida. I have been a commercial uh, broker for 15 years. I have never been a member of NAR, never sold a house, never had access to the MLS. I've never been a residential agent. I've been a true commercial agent my entire career. Um, I'm also a, a commercial developer and a licensed general contractor. Um, I spent my first eight years at Colliers International, one of the big commercial firms, and uh, specialized in retail leasing and land sales for retail development. Then I went to the development side, and I was in charge of developing mixed-use pro projects. Specifically, I developed a 52-acre waterfront site um, in the heart of Tampa, where I live. Um, during that process, I got my general contractor's license, and Two and a half years ago, I left the development company. I was ready to go back to brokerage because I am a deal maker. Um, my mom had been with EXP Realty for about five years at that point, told me they were starting a commercial division and uh, landed the job as designated managing broker. At the same time, I started my construction company, which is called Build It Brit. And I have a team that runs that during the day for me. Um, so I do both. And uh, just, I love everything about commercial real estate. I want to be a true expert on the entire life ex uh, cycle of commercial from the idea of it to the development, building it, you know, leasing it, selling it, whatever it may be. So that's what I do. I leave the residential to the professionals like you and uh, focus on my craft here on commercial, but I'm glad we kind of get to share a little bit of how we do business. And as you guys explore all these changes coming your way. Absolutely. Amazing. It just sound, all sounds so creative and so wonderful. There's, I think many of us are like, where's the guardrails? But I think that's probably what you guys love the most about it. So <laughs> uh, Charles, could you please introduce yourself? Yeah, so um, I've been in the business since, uh, I'll, I'll throw out dates and numbers here, 1987. Uh, but I started, uh, unlike Brittany, uh, completely in the commercial field. I started with uh, residential. I was uh, in the luxury market in the San Francisco Bay Area with the Grubb and Ellis Company, which did do residential back then. Um, and for the first nine years, I know what you guys went through on the residential side. Um, I was very young. I got in the business. I think it was like 21, 22. I couldn't get a listing if my life depended on it because I didn't wear glasses or have gray hair. I got plenty of it now. Um, and it was a tough road. But um, nine years into it, I switched over to uh, the industrial side of commercial real estate and been doing that ever since. And it was a logistics uh, um, department chair out here at the XP Commercial. And so, um, you know, hearing about all these things that's been happening in the residential side, I do have MLS access. I do kind of peer into it here and there, and I understand your guys' pain. It's I think you guys have one of the toughest jobs in the industry, uh, especially even now. So um, much I respect to all you folks, but I have a, a, an interesting and unique perspective of knowing from both sides of dealing with an MLS that has you know, the, the, the comp out there, as opposed to in commercial real estate, where most of the time we're dealing with databases that have properties like CoStar and, and LoopNet and Moody's and things, but there's really no generally accepted or formulated compensation kind of part of it or guarantee in it. So we've been always working with, you know, agreements and, and documents and things and writings, and you'll see. Yeah, and we've always been guaranteed. So the idea that as of two weeks ago, three weeks ago, that we are no longer guaranteed compensation unless we discuss it in advance, 
um, is a new is a new world for us. So we are so thankful you're here for us today for sure. So I'm going to share my screen to the presentation again. This is you're going to it's going to be obvious that this is two different presentations put together. They both have a blue theme though, I think. So that's kind of good. Um, but we did you know only only an EXP. I asked these guys about maybe two weeks ago if they'd be willing to do the. And both of them, without hesitating, didn't know who I was from a hole in the wall, you know, sure. And then, um, you know, I think it was like a day ago, I said, hey, do you guys have a PowerPoint? And so uh, got the couple PowerPoints like a, two hours ago and we put put stuff together. But um, I'm just so grateful for your collaboration, your generosity of spirit. Um, opening the playbook always to us within EXP is, is always um, how it works with us. So commercial presentation, this was Brit starting. So I'm going to move the slides through and whoever slide it is, please jump in and, and share on that slide. Yeah, I guess I'll start from the corporate perspective um, to make sure everybody kind of understands who we are. We are a separate company and a separate brokerage under EXPI World Holdings. Um, you know, we have EXP Realty and EXP Commercial. Again, two separate brokerages, two separate broker of records, uh, usually in most states, the bigger states. Some states still share a DMB. Uh, for all you EXP family out there, we are a lot smaller. We're never going to be your size. As you know, there's 90,000 agents and realty. We have about 800 throughout the country because we are so specialized. Um, we have different tools, different contracts, different forms, different services, um, but we are full service commercial real estate brokerage. So, you know, everyone you know who has you've sold or bought a house for either owns or works for a company that needs commercial real estate. So we always welcome referrals both sides. We try to send all the residential referrals your way. And I can tell you right now in Florida, we have about 10,000 residential agents in Florida and only 115 commercial agents. Some, some days I sign about 50 referral agreements a day. Wow. So keep that in mind that we are here. Don't forget about us. And I always like to share that. Let's say your business is mostly residential. Um, and Ooh, hold on. Sorry. My computer's doing something weird. Um, but let's say most of your business is residential, but one day that changes to commercial. You can always switch to commercial or switch back. You know, we are the same company that shares the same stocks, benefits, your downline, your upline, your sponsor stays the same, your revenue share. So I always like to share that because people seem to be curious about it, but we are here if you ever need us. All right. That's you, Britt. Perfect. Sorry, my computer like lost the screen, but I just got everything back up. Okay. So these are some of our typical documents and I'm going to preface this that no, we cannot share these with you, but yes, the EXP Realty team is working on very similar documents for you guys to have, because obviously it's state-based by laws, all that good stuff. Um, but this is some, this is stuff we've done from day one In my 15 years of doing this, I don't care if you're my best friend in the world. You don't get in my car and I don't show you a warehouse or a retail space unless I have an exclusive right to represent you. That's how I've always done it. That's how I was taught in the commercial world. It's just what we do. Obviously, the goal would be to get the exclusive representation agreement. That's like top tier. You're going to represent them on any property in whatever state you're in. Um, but if you can't get that, because sometimes it can be a little harder on the commercial side. And again, this translates over to the realty side that, um, you know, obviously we have other documents for that. Um, we have a buyer's broker agreement for exclusive, but we also have a client representation agreement that is non-exclusive, mm -hmm. meaning let's say I have a client that can, is looking throughout the state of Florida, but, um, you know, they just want me to show them a few few properties in Tampa. I'm probably, if they're not willing to sign an exclusive, then I'm going to have them sign a client rep agreement that is exclusive for the properties I show them. Again, you guys may call it something different, but this is something we've used for years. You know, also we have commission agreements in our sky slope on the commercial side for years. We've been using commission agreements that for both listed properties and unlisted properties. We deal a lot with off-market properties in the commercial world. And let's say you know someone who's thinking about selling their house and you have a buyer that would be perfect for it, but it's not officially listed on there. Guess what? You should still be using a commission agreement on, on that property. So we have that on the commercial side and I've kind of given you a few snippets, but they're very simple. Sometimes one pager forms and I know EXP is working on that for you guys as well. But basically we have a document for every situation. And as I tell my agents in Florida, you don't have a deal unless it's papered up. 
So I'll have agents come to me and be like, Hey, I was promised this and blah, blah, blah. Or it was put in an LOI, which is a letter of intent, which is non-binding. Guess what I tell them? You don't have a deal. There is no deal. It doesn't exist unless there is a legally binding commission agreement, exclusive rep agreement or whatever it may be. So, um, and then another note to that on the exclusive representation side, the way I explain it to my client, and we'll get into this later is I'll put, you know, our goal is to, you know, we will get 3% on this transaction. If we cannot obtain it from the landlord or seller, then you as my client are responsible for that. Sometimes I'll see, maybe I can only get two and a half percent on a deal, but personally, I don't work for less than three. Then guess what? That buyer's responsible for that half a percent. So we'll get into that further, but that's a little bit of a, what the type of agreements we use on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah. I, I can't wait to get into that a little bit more and push back, but um, Charles. Yeah. You so next I mean, years. and as Brittany mentioned, you know, uh, unless you get it in writing, you're not getting my car. Right. And so, right. I mean, why get into writing it? And she really kind of hit it because if you don't get around, we could go to the next slide here and just move quick. quick. You know, is it because every billion dollars of e-commerce requires over a million square feet of industrial space? Of course not. Uh, and uh, we go to the next answer. Um, we shook hands on it. You know, a lot of times uh, it's a relationship business. Uh, we work on trust, uh, obviously. But as far as compensation goes and terms of an agreement, uh, it's just not going to cut it. You go to the next slide. Um and they promised to only work with me. Well, of course they did. But, you know, a lot of times in, in the commercial world, there are people that you will deal with that perhaps are administrators and and not the people actually will be signing documents uh, that will be in charge of curating and working with you and showing properties. So it's important to get that in writing. Go next. Yeah, this, is, this definitely happens in realty. Right. Yeah, this happens exactly, where you work right. with somebody for a few months oh, and yeah. you're away for the weekend and they go to an open house. And we hope that everyone has the same code of ethics, but somehow all of a sudden the seller agent is writing an offer um, with, you know, stars in their eyes uh, for that buyer that just tripped in there. And if there's no uh, agreement, you know, you have just uh, lost a sale. Yeah, in the commercial world, sometimes, like I said, you're dealing with more than one, I'm not saying more than one decision maker, but somebody that you would be dealing with in, you know, touring properties and, and taking a look at things. And so a lot of times uh, you will get different answers from different people. You'll get a promise from somebody and then the decision maker will, will be on a whole different track of, you know, even work with a different broker. So you need to really tie that thing down. And a lot of times... In a, in a marketplace where we're working with a lot of other people in your own company, it doesn't matter who you work for, EXP or, uh, or Remax or other companies, uh, we will kind of say, hey, uh, if somebody else from uh, this, you know, this company uh, gives you a call, let them know we spoke, <laughs> you know, to kind of cover your, your tracks there in some cases. But uh, yeah, and, and sometimes in luxury, we're not dealing with the end with the decision maker. In luxury, oftentimes we're dealing with someone's, you know, someone who's looking in advance. They don't even live in the area, let's say, but they've sent someone that's on their staff to take a look at the property. And it'll be interesting to see what kind of uh, differentiators in the agreements that we'll have, because we don't always deal with the, um, in the luxury space, we do not always deal with the the person who's actually going to be signing the purchase and sale agreement. Right. Let's go next here. Um, um, so again, uh, this is kind of, obvious here but uh, i'm telling you no seller is going to say hey charles uh just want to let you know i looked over the uh commission uh, excuse me the uh, escrow instructions and the purchase agreement and i didn't find the clause that shows that we're going to pay you uh, <laughs> believe, believe me if it's not in there i'm not going to say anything i mean you know it doesn't matter if you've been working with them for 20 years it's just that's not what they're looking for so <laughs> you better make sure it's in there and there's a lot of points of the deal where um, Sorry. you know, Brittany mentioned, uh, you know, if it's in the LOI, it's in, in various forms and stages, obviously until it's in a binding, uh, format in either a lease or a purchase agreement. Remember, we're talking a lot in sales and in the residential world, uh, most of the deals are, are purchases, right? But in commercial real estate, I would beg to say that it's almost 70% of the deals are actually leases and we have the, still the same issues and challenges and uh you know paperwork to make sure we're getting paid on a lease as well as a uh 
a mm. purchase. Just yes. structured differently, I guess. Yeah, a little bit differently. Mm. Um, so, you know, and in residential real estate, I think I have found from personal experience, it seems to be all about you, your, your pictures on your uh, business card, your, your social media postings, but I listed this, I listed that, I got my buyers in here. Um, but in commercial real estate, uh, it's not about you. It's it's more about the property, about the deal. And oftentimes in residential world, I believe, you know, the commissions and stuff that are paid are usually the largest expenses in a deal for That's a, a big seller. Point, yeah. Right. But in the commercial world, there can be m many other things that could be actually more expensive or cost more for the seller or even the landlord uh, on a deal than commissions. And so it, even though it's an important part to us, um, from the seller's perspective, it's one of the items. You know, you may have a prepayment penalty on a commercial real estate loan that they need to pay off. That might be $300,000 and the commission's only 100000 uh, Or even in a lease, even on a long-term lease, uh, the compensation can get up there into the hundreds of thousands of dollars or even more. However, um, even a 1,500 square foot deal for Starbucks, they're going to uh, be asking for a half a million in TI work from the seller. So in perspective, it's a little bit different than what I think the sellers uh, and or, and of course, in the buyer end and uh, residential real estate may be looking at. Well, and you know, you make a good point, but you know, it's also around reframing, right? Like we don't, many of us do not do net sheets for sellers. I've always been like, that's not my lane. I'm going to let the lender and the attorneys and escrow and all them talking about that. But this may be the time for us to step into that a little more because we're not the biggest expense. Probably paying off the bank is a far bigger expense. And if, is, you, have right? solar, I mean, if you have solar on your roof, you could be paying that. That lien is above a municipal lien. That's the highest lien. I don't know why, but a solar lease lien, solar purchase lien, sometimes can trump anything. So there may be some other very large expenses that the seller is in fact paying, and it's not us. We've let the story be dragged into that, that we're kind of this, you know, huge. Um, yeah, we're going to kill anchor. the deal if you pay yeah, us kind yeah, of thing. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. That, that, or, or that additional half of an apple is going to kill the deal, right? And and that's that's not, we're putting that out there. We need to stand in that this is just piece, this is a piece of the total conversation, a piece of the puzzle. I think it's a really great point. All right. Yeah. So, um, you know, that initial meeting, you're assessing the requirement, uh, pitching, whatever. And of course, you're assessing to see if it's a realistic uh, requirement or or if it's going to be a waste of time. Uh, you don't have to work with everybody, right? Um, but um, we always want to secure the agreement, whatever it might be. You know, would it be an exclusive, non-exclusive, um, some sort of agreement, whether it be on the listing side or the buyer side. And if they don't, then you'll know how serious they are or what the complications are if there's other people involved in the decision making. Then we move on. Then we will then move on to tours and send them properties and things. You know, the worst thing you could do, I think, in trying to get a listing is bring in a buyer without any agreement in the hopes that you're showing good faith and you're working mm -hmm. hard and you're going to bring them a deal. And of course, the seller's thinking or even a landlord's thinking, well, shit, I don't have to sign anything if he's bringing me you know, deals already. So uh, I think it really does need and lead with, you know, the agreements and things on what's going to happen and set the table, basically. Yeah. Well, Once and you we, bring, yeah. oh, go ahead. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Well, I think the fact that there could be a number of flavors that Brittany's slide um, indicated, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. You know, we, we kind of said, oh, there'll just be one. Well, no, there'll be a single property showing. There'll be an exclusive. There'll be a, you know, who knows? We have to kind of get our arms around and, and look to what you guys have done around what those, because we can't open the door. As of mid, late July, whatever the date is, supposedly we cannot open the door without a piece of paper. It will be a requirement of the transaction. So the flavor of that agreement um, and getting familiar and comfortable with those and having conversations around those, I think is really our work and part mm -hmm. of why I wanted to do this um, presentation today. So I love the fact that you say in your initial meeting, you secure the agreement. You don't discuss it. You don't, you know, you secure it. It's signed. Boom. Before you even start a search, an MLS search. Yeah, yeah. We, we try at least, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Brett. Yeah, absolutely. So this is kind of the pitch process I go through whenever my team is pitching for 
you know, tenant representation, uh, buyer's representation, we kind of pitch the same way we would a listing. It's a, a little less work because we're not really providing like a broker opinion of value, um, but we are giving market insight. So it is a process and we put the same amount of work into it. So we start, everything's a conversation, right? I'm a big, I never believe in scripts. I just think you need to have a conversation with people. People mm -hmm. love to talk about themselves and they love to talk about their properties. It's just a fact. So have that consultation and start asking questions that are going to lead to other questions and better understand their budget, timeline, needs, and most importantly, you need to qualify that client, you know, it, especially for off-market deals, maybe more so the commercial, I'm always, you have to qualify because if they're not qualified to buy, it's not worth your time. And you need to know when to say no. And maybe it's not the, you think this could be a time-consuming uh, client for you, refer it to somebody else who it may work perfectly for. Don't be afraid to say no. And really that beginning of that conversation is really to understand their needs and see if you are the right fit. Um, then pitch your services, have a presentation, have something that you have a template for and you customize for each buyer based on their needs, but don't be afraid to brag. Don't be afraid to show your experience, your recent deals and success stories. If you're new to the industry, you probably have a mentor or a team, which EXP requires a mentor anyways. When I first started in the industry, guess what? My mentor had 25 years of experience, but combined, we had 26 years of experience. So that sounded good on paper between the two of us at the time. Um, use the team, use the company's experience to pitch yourself. Um, and don't be afraid to brag a little bit because people want to feel that they're with someone who knows what they're doing. And how do they know that? Also, your recent success stories. Tell them about a similar listing or buyer you recently helped that match, you know, their needs. And if you don't have one, tell some of the team stories. Um, have that presentation go over your services. Yes, you're going to help them look for the property. Yes, you're going to look on the MLS. Talk about the organizations you're a part of, the networking you do, that you can find deals that may not be on the market yet or are about to hit the market. Talk about the connections you have with lenders home inspectors, any type of services that you can connect them to. I have a team of great attorneys that I recommend, depending on the type of team of great lenders, uh, title companies. And guess what? It's not just one size fits all. If I have a client working on a land deal, I have them go recommend a specific set of attorneys that focuses on land. So maybe it's a luxury buyer. You want someone to review those contracts, make sure they have experience with luxury homes, whatever it may be. Then of course, your market knowledge and trends you're seeing. Um, know your market, drive your market, understand it. Anywhere I go in the market, I take a different route home, even though I've lived in Tampa my entire life, because I'm going to see something new. I'm going to see a new development of communities popping up. I'm going to see new restaurants and areas that clients might want to live or work by. Um, you know, know your area and what's coming. Stay on top of the trends and the news alerts. I get the news alerts two times a day on my phone. Um, for all commercial real estate and my market. So just know your market and add those into your presentation and update it on a monthly basis. Then, of course, set expectations, timeline of events, what's going to happen next. You know, I always explain, hey, here's here's me, here's what I do, here's my services. Um, and they'll say, okay, send me a list of property. Well, hold on a second. I don't send any properties until an agreement is signed. So then I set expectations and say, okay, great. Well, now you know about me. Next step is you're going to review my agreement. Um, here are the terms of that agreement. Um, if sometimes they'll say, well, tell me, you know, can you send me a list of properties? Guess what I'll do? I'll send a general list, meaning, hey, there's a there's a home in this market that probably fits your range, or there's several homes, you know, the number of homes in this market that fits your range, happy to send you the actual list once we have an exclusive representation or whatever it may be, that document signed. So you can be vague until the document is signed, but still give them enough info to keep them going. So tell them, um, you know, your cost, your commission structure, don't be afraid to just lay it on the table because it's, they're going to need to know. And again, give that document. I agree with Charles in that same meeting. The goal is to have them sign it during that meeting, but if not leave it with them overnight so they can review 
call them in the morning, ask them what questions and comments they have um, and say, you know, hey, here's the next plan of action, ready to get going uh, as soon as you are. Follow up with them. Don't be afraid to ask them for your their business. Um, so once you presented that, you know, that's the time to close the deal. Cause that is a deal to close, not just the actual transaction, but the deal to get the buyer. And then communication is key. Don't just give it to them and walk away. Don't just do your pitch, follow up, remind them, give them updates. Hey, you know, I've seen prices are going a little bit down in this area or a little bit higher. So communication is key and keep them updated, add them to a newsletter, Right now may not be the time for them, but maybe six months is. So follow up. I have so many clients that do that. I'll do a big pitch, big proposal. I'll follow up for a day, a week, a month later, and then I'll give them some time to breathe. And then guess what? Three to six months later, they usually come back. Yeah. Uh, I had got a couple of questions from that, but I have one. Um, no, I'll, I'll wait. I'll wait until we till Q&A. Um, so many great points. And so many of them are already logical that we have done, but a number of them are, are things that we really have not. And, and uh, continuing to systematize this, putting it into a system, putting it into part of our system. And I love what you said though, about this is part of the deal. Mm -hmm. You know, I love a signature. I love a signature. So this, for me, this is like, aha, another signature. Um, I mean, really it is, you know, and I think that we have to, that's another reframing. This is a piece of the deal. It's not just the sale, they, having them, especially an exclusive, right? I would think that that's definitely part of where we're going with all this. Oops. Let's see. Um, advice. Next, that's you, Britt. Oh, yeah. These are some of the pages that I put into my presentation. I do a summary of proposed services, kind of explaining what my process is. I obviously put my bio and everything. Um, even when I'm pitching for a listing, I put a little paragraph in there. Our typical listing fees are this, blah, blah, blah. I'm not afraid to tell them what it is. Um, but have an award-winning presentation, you know, look at other ones, ask the EXP community on workplace, what they're using in different markets, pull it together to create it your own. You don't have to start from scratch. Uh, sell yourself. I already talked about this. Um, if you're new, sell the power of the team or the brokerage. Talk about facts on EXP. I mean, workplace is a powerful tool that you can put your, you know, hey, I have a client looking for this. I can't find anything out there that works. Guess what? There's 90,000 agents on workplace right there. And then of course, EXP exclusives coming up. Yeah. Um, I already talked about this, but ask as many questions as you can about their search criteria. And you already know how to sell a home, right? So learn how to sell yourself. That is so important. Be proud of who you are and what you've achieved and make sure you are selling yourself. And again, I tell this to all my mentees, we do not work for free. Our time is valuable. Is this client worth your time or should you refer it out? Don't be afraid to say no. I, I honestly, at this point in my career, I turn down more assignments. And by turn down, I refer them to somebody else and then I, I take on because time is valuable. Um, and then network and have fun while you're doing it. Uh, my mentor always told me activity breeds activity. So if things are slow for you, I'm telling you, going to one networking event, um, having coffee with a bunch of other agents in your area with EXP, activity breeds activity, which leads to more connections and more deals to be made. Absolutely. All right. So I guess we're on to our, I just want to give, um, so this is Brittany's slide. Guys, take a screenshot. I think she's also going to put her contact again. I think I already saw it go flying through into chat. Take a screenshot of this for sure. And then I wanted to mention, Charles, if you are an EXP agent um, or if you'd like an invitation to pass, you know, a passport into uh, EXP world, um, Charles does this presentation um, once a month, I understand, uh, second Tuesdays. And it's about industrial commercial, which is a whole another world on top of, of, of uh, commercial. So um, he's really a specialist at this. This is his jam. And if you're interested in even understanding a little bit, I mean, I know, Kareen, we've had, you know, you had a number of lease, you know, we, resi agents trip over this stuff and we're not going to do it, but we'd like to know some of those words to use so we don't look like aliens, right? So even just anyone getting a, a little bit more familiar with these terms is a really smart idea. And I know this is available for everybody uh, inside of workplace. So with that, I'm going to stop my share and I'm going to um, open it up. It's about 20 of, so we've got some good time for questions. I've already got a couple, but I want to make sure that we open it up to uh, folks that are here. If you have a question, 
If you might want to raise your hand or put it in the chat, raise hand or put your question in the chat, be happy to uh, open it up now and hopefully it stirred some questions for you guys. Who is going to start? Okay, well, as always, I have questions. Okay. <laughs> um, so one of the first ones was, you guys mentioned a different agreement for listed and not listed properties. And I th that was curious to me. So we typically, we typically don't deal with a lot of off-market properties. We do that a little bit more in luxury. And now we have Zenlist. We have EXP exclusives, which is continuing to build that pipeline of properties that are off-market. You know, there's thoughts on both sides of that, but we it's not something that we're completely used to doing again, except for on the luxury end, we do more of that yeah. um, for a variety of reasons, but talk a little bit about what the difference in, in terms of a buyer agreement for listed and unlisted. Absolutely. Um, well, that would be a commission agreement. And one thing we haven't brought up, but in the commercial world, we don't usually, I rarely see a commission listed on a listing. We always have to ask and honestly negotiate what our commission is going to be. So if it's an off-market properties, like let's say it's, uh, you know, someone who's owned a warehouse for a long time and wasn't planning on selling, but we've cold called because we have a buyer that's interested in it and he says, yes, I'll sell, but I'm not going to pay any commissions. Well, guess what? Then we're going to go to our buyer for that commission. Um, but if it's unlisted, then we're negotiating a commission not based on a listing agreement. If it's a listed property, we are asking for a certain amount of that listed commission. So let's say the listing agent is getting 7%. Maybe we're going to ask for 4% of that if I'm repping a national, you know, retail tenant. So on a, on a tenant representation. So again, everything's a negotiation and, you don't know how much that listing agent is getting, but we're going to negotiate and ask for, you know, what we think we deserve on that. So that's the difference because sometimes we're dealing with something that's already listed and has a listing agreement in place and we're taking a portion of that fee or we're negotiating with an unlisted property and we're asking the seller to pay us a certain amount of fee. So if the property is listed, mm -hmm. meaning it's in CoStar or it's listed somewhere, that, that's what you mean, right? That it's listed. Well, if they have a listing agreement, yes. With the, so If uh, there's a listing agreement, does the listing agent, are they, are, are they required to tell you what the, what the commission is? Yeah, no, because we, that, we don't have that either. Yeah. Maybe sometimes we find it out in the purchase and sale. Maybe sometimes we don't. So everyone's, all the purchase and sales are different, right? Sometimes they specify total we commission. negotiate. Tax. Yeah. Okay. There, there are some actual MLSs still around uh, in the country in commercial, even the American Industrial Real Estate Association, which uh, kind of birthed all these AAR CRE forms, does have kind of a MLS membership based thing, and they used to actually publish the comp, uh, either sale or lease in the actual, I guess their version of MLS. Um, I don't know if they kind of stopped doing that because that's through, uh, they used uh, Moody's as their search engine. Um, but uh, yeah, you have to ask. So the four questions we always ask when okay. we're calling a broker to, uh, you know, just to inquire. So first, uh, is it available? Do you have anything out for signatures? You got leases out or LOIs out? That'll establish if it's available and what activity there is. Uh, number two, what are the Turing instructions? Uh, and number three, what's the broker comp? You know, what are you guys offering? Um, you know, you probably know since you're marketing, you must have a listing agreement. So what's the broker comp? They'll tell you. And then number four, ask for some deal guidance. You know, what are the sellers looking for? What are the tenants or the landlord looking for? And in most commercial real estate conversations between brokers, we're, we're very helpful to each other. We want to do the deal. We want to actually help you make the deal. And sometimes they will tell you, come in with a a, a five-year deal, don't ask for more than one month of free rent, uh, come up with this number, you know, the cam charges of this are on a sale. Um, we, you know, we got a big prepay we got to deal with. So I was going to net out about this. And I know you mentioned with the net thing, if you're approaching a seller and saying, oh, I'm not going to pay commissions, no big deal. We'll build it into the deal uh, and the buyer will know about it, you know, um, and that's where that net figure sometimes will come into place. But that uh, that fourth question of getting you know deal guides is very important. So then in one phone call you figure out if it's available with the activities. Number two, um, you know you know how to show it. Number three, you know you're going to get 
there's at least an offer or something in there to get paid that's followed up by paperwork. When we write the LOI in these things, we will also mention in the LOI that we're expecting some compensation from the some agreement with the sales broker. We're not going to mention numbers, but then in a separate letter, we will send along with the LOI to the brokerage is we, we call it a comp letter. And it's basically saying, hey, look, uh, we understand you have a listing agreement and we're expecting X amount to be paid at, at close or at uh, lease execution or what have you. And uh, by receiving this letter, uh, you know, you're agreeing to it kind of thing. And even though that's not a binding contract, it's also there to remind you that, hey, we're expecting to get paid. And uh, these are the terms we're, we're expecting again. And uh, once we nail down the lease and or the purchase agreement, that's where it's kind of all laid out uh, in writing. Yeah. And, you know, we do three of those four, right? Of course, is it available? Um, you know, how, how do we get in? What are the instructions? Um, what's a win-win for your seller? Always a question that a good agent should ask because those things are very different, right? And But we had, do not typically, that's been disclosed. So it's that piece that, you know, we will continue to work on, of course. Well, one more thing I might add on these agreements is, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of people will think, oh, I got to get the buyer to sign this thing and they're going to have to maybe pay me or out of pocket. But most of the agreement shows what the broker is going to do for them. You know, they're going to um, yeah, they put it in this kind of agreement or, you know, diligently search for properties. Uh, uh, even often in these agreements list what they're looking for and what the goal is. So a lot of the agreement is basically on what you're going to do for them and not so much how much you're going to get paid on Give the, me the money. Show me the money. So yeah, you really have to think true. about, all right, I'm going to offer this and look at it as, well, I'm going to offer you a promise for what I'm going to do for the compensation. It's not about, I'm going to try to get someone to get me to pay me if I do a deal. And so you have to turn it around that way and say, I'm offering you something that not everyone will offer you. And in the residential world, now that this all is happening, it's not like you're the only person to ask for this, right? Before, yes. if you were, they probably look at you going, I don't know. nobody else is asking for it. That's such a great point. And, and they've always had in those buyer, exclusive buyer agreements that we've had always that we don't use, they do specify a gazillion things that we're going to do uh, as buyer agents. We're going to do, yeah. Yeah, it's already so it's there. It's more of a promise to us. Don't you want to employ somebody in writing to work for you? You know, do you want to get ghosted after two weeks after we we find you being very annoying you know no there here's a promise that we're going to work for you yeah yeah so cheryl black asked a question about retainers and i know that that's a piece of you know is it going to be a percentage is it going to be a flat fee is it going to be a retainer so she said um you know are people do you think people are going to start asking for retainers up front so even if a signed agreement does not guarantee commission we can't work for free how do we handle a retainer do mean do you guys deal with that do you deal with retainers up front I don't. Do you, Charles? Um, we only work when we're doing consulting work, let's say a broker yeah. price opinion or maybe a lease abstract or things. We will usually charge for that. And sometimes it's up front and it's not. But, you know, the, the thing that does mean you'll get paid if the agreement is in writing. Well, I mean, that's as good as it's going to get. You know, there's Obviously, the, the agreement in writing, and then there's the action to back that up, right? Whether it be the escrow company administering, you know, what you guys agreed upon, uh, or in a lease, you're basically sending an invoice to get paid. And that's kind of a, they already signed the agreement. So you're just following them with the invoice. If they don't pay, then, you know, your alternatives are in the legal field. Right. I do charge for broker opinion of values if they don't plan on listing in the next six months or so. Okay. Um, and usually I get about $1,500 per broker opinion of value. Um, and I have um, national tenants that sometimes just want to know what they think, not tenants, but uh, owners. Like uh, I did one recently for Sun State Equipment in Tampa. They have already have the space. They want to make sure it's worth what they think it's worth. They didn't want to hire a full appraisal. And every six months or so, they'll ask me to do one on another building in Florida. And I, I know they're not planning on using me anytime soon. I know they will eventually when they you know, the time comes. So I will charge for broker and opinion of values. Cause why remember we don't work for free. Our time is valuable and they're honest that they're not ready to list anytime soon. So I don't take any retainers with new clients. Um, but I do make sure everything's papered up. 
I love that papered up. I'm going to still be using that. We don't, we don't, I mean, I, we don't usually use those words, but I love it. Um, hey, what happens when you realize that there is not a good fit? Do those have terms? How do you get out of that? Just, the, I mean, I hate to bring up when we, we still can't even get into it. How do you get out of it though? What, that's just a question that came to me when you guys were presenting. Are you mentioned like if we've already papered up and we're working with an, a client? Correct, correct, mm -hmm. correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, if both parties agree, then it's easy to get out of the, uh, you know, the agreement as long as both, you know, sign that they want to terminate it. So usually it's, uh, try not to do that too often. I've usually vetted them pretty well enough to know that I want to work with them, but trust me, I have done it. Um, I recently just canceled a listing because the owner was not honest about some lawsuits on the property. I mean, it happens in all types of our business, not just buyer or tenant rep. Um, so there comes a time where you got to ask, is it worth what you're doing and is it good for your business and your sanity? Yeah. And I think that's so important that we have, we have a choice today, you know, but I just didn't know if there was any, you know, if that's something that happened very often, Charles, do you ever run into that where you just realize that it's not a good fit? The person is, you know, not doing what they said or their financial situation has changed, or I don't know what would, you know, what would drive that. Well, that could be one factor. I remember uh, there was a point where the market was not so great. I can't remember when it was around, but uh, I think I had about 54 listings at the time and it was a fairly slow market, at least on the uh, uh, tenant side. And either the lease or the, the listing would come up for renewal or, you know, the listing agreement would expire or we'd be in the middle of it and we haven't had activity, nothing. And it's very frustrating to both of us. And sometimes we'll go, hey, you know what? Maybe it might be a good change for you. I've got a, uh, another uh, colleague that works for a different company that uh, maybe it might be good for a change. I, this happens very rarely, but in some markets, uh, a lot of the brokers in the same community will respect each other and say, hey, why don't you try you know, Mike Smith uh, over with uh, Blank Bank Company, and you know, maybe uh, you guys will hit it off. And Mike will call me maybe a few months later. Hey, I've got a guy here we've been working at, but things aren't working. Believe it or not, that actually does happen, not very often, and depends on the market. But again, we're trying to do the best for our clients and trying to get mm -hmm. a deal done. And if it's not happening, it's not working, sometimes just for the sake of keeping something because you have an agreement, isn't in the best interest of both of you rarely it happens so but it do you, it, you have typically longer because i think your sales cycle are typically longer than ours we usually listings i mean kind of six months buyer agreements i think we used to do six or 12 months if we did them what are the terms that you typically use just from a, a yeah, we, you know. we usually start at 12 months uh, okay. one year and if things need to change things need to change if you hate us you want to fire us Rarely we'll put in an agreement. You can cancel it in 48 hour notice. I, I don't want to work with someone who doesn't want of to course. work with me. Yeah. You know, and I think uh, unless I've done something already, we've gotten a deal and then they want to wiggle out of it or something, but uh, which doesn't happen that often. I but, always uh, start know. at 12 months as well. And uh, I'll go down to six if we have to. Um, but when people ask me for a three month agreement, it's not, again, that's unrealistic. Yeah. And um, it's not worth my time. But yeah, I always start at 12. And I suspect there'll be some kind of provisions in there like we have now that if the client has seen something within 180 days or 360 yes. days, whatever, there's going to be that kind of language so okay, that if, in cool. fact, something dreadful, I mean, I don't think I've ever followed through with any of that. I don't think anything like that's happened, but I mean, it's there to protect, it you know. Well, and I have, I have used that language before. So, yes, it's there for a reason. Yeah. And I have had sellers use that language for a reason meaning on the 181th day they will exercise and sell it to the person we showed it to or something yeah. i mean yeah so whatever's in writing sometimes uh it can uh it can help you or maybe not so much but uh, that's why it's so important to get it in writing yeah no no kidding i mean i i think we've all gotten some really great um kind of you know guidelines about what needs to be in this new elevator pitch and also, I know I've just gained some confidence even in listening to you guys this morning about the fact that, and, and kind of fortunately, we're going to be forced into it, right? It's not a discussion anymore. You know, we are required to have this agreement before I can have the pleasure of showing you this property. So here's what my agreement is. Mm -hmm. Kaboom. You know, and I I think that that is going to be, you know, that's just going to be so important that we feel the confidence kind of in that. Let me ask again, if anyone else that's listening in has any additional questions.
you guys get answered every question I guess that no, they have. They're all afraid to ask. I, I don't have a question, but I want to share my appreciation for this event and uh, the insight and the wisdom that you share with us today. Thank you. Oh, right. thank, thank you. you so much, Pia. Yeah, most definitely. I second that sentiment. All right. Thanks, Daniel. Nice to see you. Good to see you. I'm glad. Yeah. Thanks, thank you, everyone. So quick, real quickly, I want to say what's changing? Buyers are going to be required to have a buyer agreement, right? That's what's changing. What's not changing is that this, you know, the, as always, we will negotiate what that compensation looks like. And it might be a percentage. It might be a flat fee. We're not sure. Um, what's changing that that's not going to be in the MLS anymore in the front half of an MLS. As I said earlier in the presentation, it looks like MLSs are finding, are going to insert um, different kind of concession fields. So it still may be there. Um, and then what's not changing, sellers can um, offer concessions in, in closing costs and all of that. We're dealing with Fannie, Freddie, VA to find out, you know, all lending. Lending's been waiting. Lending didn't just find out about this two Fridays ago or three Fridays ago, right? So lending is really looking at how are we going to be able to maybe add this as a line item in closing costs so that that is another option for everybody. That's definitely been on the table. So I think the biggest change, again, is that there has to be this buyer agreement up front. We're going to continue to give you all kinds of resources around that. I know EXP um, has a great buyer guide, buyer representation guide that they put out. And just Wednesday in the luxury division, we released our luxury buyer guide, which is beautiful. All you need to do is press the button and all of your logos and everything goes through there. It's very elegant. I think it's 18 pages. It really outlines everything in a very elegant format. The same information kind of for the most part, but it looks, you know, it's got all the luxury branding. So we have all of that for you. Um, and we will send around um, copies of the presentation, um, the, pres the, uh, the presentations that we did, as well as this recording. I want to thank everybody for popping in today. I know your time is really valuable, especially noontime or whatever time it is in your time zone, um, nine o'clock in the morning, Charles. Uh, time is super valuable. We hope that you've gotten some value from today's um, session. And Brittany and Charles, you guys are rock stars. Thank you so much for just dropping everything and saying yes and being willing to come out here and talk to um, all these resi agents. Thank you so much, Lisa. Yeah, it was great. Thank, thank, you. thank you so much.